Good morning. I'm Jeff Cowan, the Dean of the uh, Annenberg School for Communication, and I want to ask, we have an overflow crowd, which is always wonderful as people are sitting in their pews here. Uh, it's a, a very special event for all of us to be able to inaugurate this chair. And um, I want to thank uh, so many civic leaders as well as members of our faculty and students and people from across ca uh, the campus, deans of other schools, uh, Reverend Cecil Murray, who it's always a great uh, privilege to have with us here on the campus, uh, and others who are here today. Um, we have, a, uh, I think, a very special program in store, and I think it speaks to the importance of religion in the life of this university, that there actually are two other religious events that are taking place later today talking about the importance of religion, including a, a wonderful program that's being run by the School of Religion. But I wanted to start by uh, not just welcoming you, but saying a special word about the man who will be welcoming you on behalf of the university, and that's Lloyd Armstrong. He's been the provost at this university for the last 12 years, is that right? And uh, it's during that time that the university has really taken off, that it's, uh, it has really become a great university during those period, that period in terms of the quality of students and faculty truly building on excellence. It's been a great joy and privilege for all of us to work with him. And I know that uh, everyone in this room shares my feelings of appreciation for everything he's done, joy for him as he moves on to a next stage, but sadness for all of us because he has done such a spectacular job. Uh, Provost Lloyd Armstrong. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Dean Callan, for that uh, more than generous uh, uh, introduction. Uh, I'm really always pleased when I get an opportunity uh, to speak at the uh, inauguration of a, of a new chair. Uh, chairs are incredibly important for universities and for the development of universities. As all of you know, uh, an endowed chair is, is, the, is the highest honor that we can give to a faculty member. And as such, it uh, is enormously important for the university, for the deans, for the schools, in helping to attract the best people in the country to our university, and enormously helpful in, uh, in enabling us to keep the very best people here once we have them. So it's always a, a great event when we uh, inaugurate someone into a chair. Uh, it's a step, it's a demonstration in a sense of the continuing evolution of the university, the continuing bringing to the university of uh, really exciting new faculty. Um, the, uh, all of you, I'm sure, have read and memorized our many uh, strategic plans and. <laughs> And uh, if you have not, we have copies for everybody as you're, as you're heading out. But you all know that the sort of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach to problems has become over the last decade a real hallmark of this institution. Uh, this chair uh, represents uh, in many ways uh, an example of what it is we're trying to accomplish. Uh, it is, of course, a chair that brings together religion and journalism, uh, obviously a, a, a combination which is of tremendous importance in the world today. Uh, and uh, we're really, really very delighted that we were able to have a chair in areas such as this that reach across these areas. So as well as, uh, as participating in the, uh, the joy of have bringing a new faculty member into, the, into our uh, Trojan family here. I also want to take this time to thank the Knight Foundation uh, because they have brought us this wonderful chair which does advance our strategic plan of the university. And of course, they have also uh, funded the, uh, the, the Western Knight Center which also brings together faculty from a number of different areas around the school, again, uh, helping to support our strategic plan. So 
just in closing, I want to I want to thank the Knight Foundation for what they are, are doing for us here today to help us move forward, and I want to uh, add uh, my welcome to the to the wonderful uh, new faculty member who will be taking this uh, this position, Diane Winston, who I think uh, demonstrates very clearly what I said at the outset. Um, this chairs of this type enable us to bring together, to bring into our university truly wonderful, outstanding faculty. Thank you all very much. I guess normally one wouldn't introduce the president of a foundation at great length, but it's nevertheless too tempting to say a few words about Hotting Carter especially on what happens to be very close to a special birthday for him. Uh, Hotting uh, graduated summa cum laude from Princeton, and I can't think of anything more appropriate than the fact that Diane Winston got her PhD from Princeton. And so there's a wonderful Princeton connection there and a wonderful academic connection. Hotting, as many of you know, but some may not remember, was the uh, editor and a reporter uh, and family owner of the Delta Times Democrat during a very, very important period in this country's history in Mississippi. And during that time in 1961, he won the award from the Society of Professional Journalists for Best Editorial Writing at a time that it took great courage to write editorials about issues involving civil rights and integration uh, in the South. He went on, as many people will remember, to be the principal spokesman in the Jimmy Carter administration for the, sec for the State Department with a certain degree of knightly fame uh, during the Rand contra uh, hostage period. Uh, he did great work in that job. And then uh, he became uh, the chief correspondent for PBS's wonderful documentary series, Frontline, and won four primetime Emmy awards. Uh, he then became the holder of the Knight Chair at the University of Maryland the first holder of that chair, showing uh, Diane Winston that there are future things for Knight shareholders. It doesn't have to be the last thing. You can become a foundation president. Under his leadership, as Lloyd mentioned, uh, the Knight Foundation has funded not only this chair here, but also uh, great journalism programs all around the country, and it's funded the Western Knight Center here, which we're particularly proud of. And during his leadership, the Knight Foundation has now completed funding to this date, I believe, 18 different chairs in journalism. This is enormously important, not just for this university, but around the country. It's elevated all of journalism education, something that I know that Hotting believes in very deeply. So it is my great privilege, as well as personal honor, to be able to introduce Hotting Carter. Thank you, Jeff. It's a very good thing when, between the provost and Jeff, uh, every one of my horns have already been played, and so I can cut out half the speech, which is about what it is that Knight Foundation does, et cetera, et cetera. Let me tell you, though, with or without that, how very enthusiastic I am, how very happy I am about this occasion, about this chair, about this moment. Uh, I've spent about 10 years when I was and wasn't president of Knight Foundation advocating for and helping people develop ideas around the need to bridge one of those huge cultural gaps which exists between our newsrooms and certain institutions in this country. One of them was the military and the media. One was religion and the media. Uh, and I'm happy that this is a fruition, not so much of my brilliance, but of the willingness of a university to come up with a truly innovative way to adapt this chair to its purposes and for us, of course, to be able to support it. Foundation presidents uh, are notorious for taking credit for giving away other people's money, and I am not for a moment not going to do the same thing. <laughs> but those 18 chairs were, in fact, uh, begun by another very, very fine foundation executive, my predecessor, Creed Black, an idea which arose from his very fertile mind and which was well launched, including me holding one of the chairs before I ever got there. But I'm also really happy about this occasion because, as you heard, it does mark 
another step in the deepening of a relationship with USC, fourth night. We are, after all, tucked way down at the bottom of America's appendix, which means that we're not exactly close to the West Coast in many different ways, and discovering the realities of this kind of a vibrant institution, the work that is being done here at Annenberg at the School of Journalism itself, uh, for us to finally have made that discovery and on my watch, I have to tell you, is something that I'm very proud of in both cases. I'm confident, finally, uh, that Diane is going to be a stunning shareholder. Uh, I think that because the combination that you look for in a chair is deep competence in the subject and a willingness to relate to an audience, whatever it may be. And in both these uh, cases, uh, we are going to have that in this new chair. So I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank the university for having created this opportunity for Knight Foundation. And as one of the first seven Knight chairs who were all male, I also want to tell you that USC has helped us begin to redeem ourselves <laughs> so that the last five of the last seven have, in fact, been women. And one of these days, perhaps in the year 220, we will come up with parity in this field. It's great being here. Thank you. I'm Michael Parks. I'm the director of the School of Journalism. Um, thank you for coming. This is a great day in the life of the School of Journalism, and we're uh, happy, we're proud, and we're uh, delighted uh, to have uh, Harding here and the provost. Four years ago when Knight asked for proposals for a chair in media and religion, we grabbed it with both hands. This is something we really wanted. Religion, spirituality, Moral values are at the heart of each of us. And they're not covered by the news media, not nearly enough, not well enough. And we wanted to be part of fixing that. We had a national search. In fact, it was international in the event. We had more than 20 very good candidates. Diane Winston was the unanimous choice of the search committee and of the faculty. So who is Diane Winston? Academically, BA from Brandeis, masters from the Harvard Divinity School, masters from the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, masters and PhD in religion from Princeton. Journalistically, she's an alumna of the Baltimore Sun, the Dallas Times Herald, the Raleigh News and Observer, and in the year of convergence, before there was convergence, WNEW TV in New York City. She's directed projects at Princeton and NYU studying religion in American life. She's been a program officer at the Pew Charitable Trust for religion and media and religion and academic scholarship. She was perfect. <laughs> and we were happy we were able to persuade her to move from Princeton to Los Angeles. Her mission here is as straightforward as it is huge, to improve the coverage of religion, spirituality, and moral values in the American news media. Nothing less and to help us all to understand the role that religion and spirituality and moral values have in American life. We're delighted that you're here, Diane. Come speak. <laughs> Thank 
you, Michael. Thank you, Harding. Thank you, Lloyd. And thank you, Jeff. And thank you to all my friends and family and students and colleagues who have come to celebrate with me today. Now, before I start, I have to ask my dad one thing. Am I finally forgiven for not going to the Air Force Academy? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I can continue. Um, I have to tell you one thing before I start. I have not been this excited since my wedding and my dress costs more. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's Southern California for you. Mark Twain, that wonderful writer and keen observer of religion was also an inveterate cusser. One day while shaving, he let loose a string of expletives and his wife, who hated the habit, stood nearby and listened quietly. When he finished, she turned to him and repeated his litany word for word. My dear, he said, you know the words, but you just don't have the rhythm. <laughs> In one sense, we've got the words. I met a friend for coffee earlier this week and he looked up admiringly at me from his newspaper and said, as if somehow I had engineered this, religion is everywhere. <laughs> Not so long ago, many of us complained that the press ignored religion. Now they seem to cover it, well, religiously. <laughs> Just to see if I was maybe exaggerating this, I asked Sarah Brown, who is my wonderful assistant, to gather up all the articles, letters to the editors, and editorials from the LA Times and the New York Times from the week of March 25th to March 31st. Sarah sent me 186 pages. There was everything from pieces covering Holy Week and Easter hats, the Shivo case, Iraqi women, Catholic bishops condemning the death penalty, the Supreme Court case on religious practices in prison, the INS decision to deny a visa application to a Hindu nationalist, Muslim women leading a prayer service in New York, a Honduran priest fighting deforestation, an Orthodox rabbi seeking to resolve scripture and science, the Vatican criticizing the Da Vinci Code, Southern California Christian groups buying up low power radio stations, Muslim honor killings in Germany, skateboard ministries, a new TV show on the end of days, and profiles of Buddhist scholar Robert Thurman, singer and soul saver Al Green, and WASP eminence William Sloan Coffin. Politics, courts, science, entertainment, international affairs, women's rights, bioethics, capital punishment, and the environment. And that was just in one week. Religion is everywhere. It's no longer confined to a Saturday church page. And it's up to every reporter in every news outlet to have a working fluency of the topic. So the quantity is there, but what about the quality? Today I want to talk a little bit about how I think we can improve the quality by going beyond our preconceptions about what religion should be and actually seeing what it is. That is, paying attention to the words and hearing the rhythm. Words and rhythm are key to the journalist's work in the 21st century. Together they create the imaginative space for us to understand ideas, attitudes, and behaviors different from our own. We no longer have the luxury to separate ourselves from seemingly alien worldviews. In fact, the absolute conflict of religious absolutes, the absolute conflict of religious absolutes, is brought into our homes on a daily basis. This is the substance of stories that journalists tell when covering, when covering Israeli settlers, the last days of Terry Schiavo, or debates about the context, contents of high school science texts. But are our stories faithful to our audiences with whom, in the words of Bill Moyers, we have a sacred contract to report what we can about how the world really works? Sometimes that reporting is straightforward. More frequently, it's not. And that's why I want to consider the words and the rhythms. Because in our understandable zeal to meet deadlines, please editors, and move on to the next big thing, we sometimes give these short shrift. 
and at a time when our work increasingly reflects struggles with religious and ideological absolutes, any lack of attention is unfortunate. What do I mean? Using a handy word instead of the correct one. Cults, sects, churches, religions, the term chosen reflects and telegraphs information about status, respectability, and trustworthiness. Calling the Branch Davidians a cult arguably had political implications. Likewise, when does the believer become a fanatic? When does the term fundamentalist serve as an epithet rather than a description? Scriptures, logos, Torah, in many traditions, words don't just shape reality, they call it into being. Arguably, we in the media do the same thing. When Duke Ellington said, it don't mean a thing if it, don't, if it ain't got that swing, he was jiving up Twain. Words may create reality, but rhythm brings it to life. Rhythm is passion, mystery, awe, and wonder. It's a spark that makes each of us unique and the essence of otherness. You know what I'm talking about. You could be talking to a parent or a partner or a friend, and all of a sudden they'll say something, and you'll realize how totally different this person is from anything you ever imagined. This person really is not you. Now, it would be difficult to go through every day if we were constantly open to the radical otherness of everyone we meet, but we, writers and members of the press, need to truly hear what our subjects are saying. This can be hard when reporting on stories in which religious absolutes are different than our own. Anthropologist Susan Harding, who ran into this when writing a book about Jerry Falwell, developed what she calls narrative belief, the gap between conscious belief and, unwilling, and willing unbelief. Robert Orsi, a religious studies scholar, describes this in-between place in his new book, Between Heaven and Earth. And I'm quoting Orsi. This is, a, this is an in-between orientation located at the intersection of self and other, at the boundary between one's own moral universe and the moral universe of another. And it entails disciplining one's heart and mind to stay in this in-between place, in a posture of disciplined attentiveness, especially indifference. What does Orsi mean and why is it relevant to us? Those aha moments when we see loved ones as they are remind us how difficult it is to see beyond our own assumptions. And among our own assumptions, conscious or not, is a perception of religion as good or bad. Good religion, our religion, fosters peace, love, and understanding. It's moral, virtuous, refined, and restrained. Bad religion is chaotic, violent, and destructive. It drives people to drink poison and handle snakes, strap on bombs and blow up buses. We in the media, as well as in academia, assume good religion is normative. That is the way religion with a capital R really is, and that bad religion is a perversion. It's true that violence that springs from religiously motivated acts is always wrong and inexcusable, but it is equally correct that religion encompasses the fullness of existence. Birth and death, peace and war, reason and irrationality, tolerance and prejudice, quiet meditation and unrestrained ecstasy. We miss the whole story when we overlook, minimize, or condescend to the otherness of faith that wild and crazy, passionate and, yes, unfathomable love of God. That is not to excuse or advocate religion that leads to destruction, but it is to call for understanding it. Borrowing a page from Bill Moyer's recent speeches, I want to look and see how this applies to a set of beliefs. I don't need to go very far to do this. I am always surprised at how many of my true blue, and I use the term in a political sense, my true blue friends and colleagues uh, know about popular Christian eschatology. The ideas I am about to describe are not held by all Christians or all evangelicals. It's estimated that evangelicals represent 25 to 40 percent of the population and only 15 to 18 percent believe in the rapture, but that's still a lot of people. So several million people among us believe we are living in the end times. That means the second coming of Jesus Christ is imminent. Events worldwide, from the creation of the State of Israel to the recent tsunami, are proof. Any time now, true believers will be raptured. They will fly up to heaven, and from that lofty perch, 
watch his terrible times unfold here on earth. The Antichrist, posing as a Satan, will create a one world government. Wait, did I say posing as a statesman? <laughs> posing as a statesman. But he is really Satan. That's where I got confused. We'll create a one world government and throw all to Satan. We'll all be stamped by 666, the sign of the beast, and a saving remnant of 144,000 Jews will convert to Christianity. When things can't get any worse, the final battle between good and evil will take place on the plains of Megiddo, more commonly known as Armageddon. At the end, the forces of good will triumph, Satan is bound, and Jesus rules for a thousand years. So why am I telling you this story? First, it has commercial legs. A series of popular books, the Left Behind novels, which fictionalize the occurrences, has sold 42 million copies, and that does not even count for spin-off comic books, websites, and movies. Then there's the forthcoming TV miniseries that will go over this ground, not to mention the popularity of T-shirts and other consumer items that display messages about the end times. But rapture theology informs more than business or entertainment stories. It's also part of the social and political calculations of many among us. Much of the evangelical support for Israel and the Iraqi war reflects the end times narrative about the fate of the Middle East. And for other examples, you might look at www.raptureready.com, where, much like the atomic scientist's doomsday clock, the rapture index looks at everything from the price of oil to the debate over gays to set the daily numbers. I think we're at about 153. Over 145 is critical. <laughs> Some of this has been reported, usually in the kooks and spooks genre. But if you really accept journalism's sacred trust and its role in educating and informed citizenry, then objectifying or dismissing otherness will not get us where we want to go. I'm curious about how real people use the end times narrative to organize and understand their lives how it shapes decisions about health care, education, and finances. What does it mean to live under the shadow of the end of the world, or perhaps more accurately, to live with the assurance of eternal life? Faith is not just about peace, love, and understanding. It's also about good and evil, victory over death, and ultimate salvation. Religion's power, passion, mystery, and irrationality place it at a distance from the safe world in which, for many of us, is what to buy for dinner, and our most fervently held article of faith is all is for the best in this best of all possible worlds. But what to do? How to report on and write about a passionate otherness we barely understand and that flies in the face of everything we believe? Well, this is what the night chair is about. Not just this chair, but all the chairs. In their great wisdom, the Knight Foundation created an opportunity for questioning, revisioning, and revitalizing our profession. The chairholders, whose specialty is run from politics and health care to ethics and in the environment, have one commandment. Make a difference in the profession and by, an ex by extension, the world we live in. I hope to make a difference to students, working journalists, and the larger community. I want to teach students not only to ask the right questions, but to hear the real answers. I want to challenge journalists to seek out different voices and to tell new stories. And I want to offer opportunities for the community at large to reflect on the many ways in which religion, spirituality, and values intersect our lives. I don't have to convince you that religion is central to the world we live in. That's obvious. But I can ask you to glimpse the power and vitality that fuels the beliefs and behaviors behind today's headlines. Our mission is to teach journalists to learn the words and hear the rhythms, to see the great diversity within Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, and a hundred more other, other new and older faiths, and to listen with disciplined attentiveness to unfamiliar stories, and not to back off when someone says, God told me, Allah wills it, or Jesus is my favorite philosopher. From where I stand, the Knight Foundation looks tremendously prescient. The decision to establish this chair set in motion several years ago was apt, and the Annenberg School willingness to assume the burden 
of turning a great idea into a substantive reality is laudable. Hopefully, in this best of all possible worlds, the first chairholder will do them proud. Now, um, unlike my wedding, I don't have any bouquets to throw. But if I did, it would certainly land on the lap of a gentleman sitting in the first row. This inaugural year, we've sponsored seminars, speakers, and panels that try to show students, journalists, and the community the range of things that need to be discussed when one thinks truly, um, truly passionately, intellectually, and authentically about religion and public life. It is my good fortune to introduce to you today a scholar, a gentleman, and a leader who is one of those people who thinks a lot about religion and public life and whose understanding of the complex issues is helping secular havens inside and outside the Beltway be more rigorous in their own approach to this topic. Luis Lugo is executive director of the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, and he has graciously agreed to um, to add something substantive to this day. Now, before I bring Luis up, I want to tell you the three things you need to know about him. One, you cannot stump him on any sports trivia question. <laughs> Two, he has a PhD from the University of Chicago in political science. And three, he's a mensch. Luis? <laughs> Thank you very much. What a pleasure it is for me to be here with you on this very important occasion and to finally have the chance to tell you what I really think about Diane Winston. <laughs> First though, let me tell you about what I really think about the University of Southern California. I am a big admirer of this university and I say that, mind you, despite the very painful fact that the Trojans have replaced my beloved Miami Hurricanes as the premier team in college football. <clears throat> Don't say that to Donna Shalala, please, uh, Hadi, when you go back to, uh, to Miami. Now, why is that the case? Because this is a university, in my view, that demonstrates on a consistent basis that the term entrepreneurial can indeed be applied to an academic institution, which is why I had absolutely no hesitation in my previous position as director of the religion program at the Pew Charitable Trust to recommend to the board of the trust you, the University of California, Southern California as a wonderful philanthropic opportunity for their investment, one with a high potential for yielding impressive results, and indeed, as part of the trust's national program to establish what we call centers of excellence on religion and public life in some of our leading universities, the trust board supported and continues to support the highly successful Center for Religion and Civic Culture here at SC, led so ably by Professor Don Miller, whom I believe is in the audience today. In the back. The university's forward-looking thinking was further confirmed to me by the fact that even as our own U.S. government is only now beginning in earnest to critically visit the important task of rebuilding our country's efforts in the area of public diplomacy, USC Annenberg anticipated the need and launched its Center on Public Diplomacy. And I had the opportunity to review a very early draft of that proposal, so again, another indication of, of my estimation for this university. It came as no surprise, therefore, to me when I learned that the Knight Foundation had chosen this great university to establish the Knight Chair in Media and Religion, nor that the leadership of USC Annenberg would choose Diane Winston uh, as the first occupant of that chair. 
Now at the Pew Forum, uh, we work very hard to live up to our reputation of objectivity and impartiality. When it comes to Diane, though, I just have to take a pass on that. I'm going to take off my Pew Forum hat for a moment to heartily congratulate the university for choosing someone of Diane's caliber to join its faculty and occupy this very important and prestigious chair. I suspect that what attracted you to her is the same set of impressive skills and diverse professional background that attracted us at Pew when we brought her on board several years ago to manage two of our largest portfolios, religion and media and religion and academic life. Diane's excellent scholarly credentials gave her immediate standing in the academy and made it possible for her effectively to implement the Centers of Excellence strategy I mentioned earlier. Uh, BU, uh, Boston University sociologist Peter Berger has memorably described the United States as a country of Indians governed by Swedes, <laughs> by which he means that at the grassroots level, this country is as religious as India, uh, but at the elite level, and particularly in certain professions, uh, it is as secular as Sweden, thus a country of Indians governed by Swedes. I have to say, though, that based on our experience at Pew in working with some of the best universities in the country, it seems to me that if the Swedes and the, and the Academy have not themselves become Indians, they certainly are beginning to recognize that most people in the world are. And as a result, they are taking religion much more seriously in their teaching and in their scholarship. Diane knows that world of religion and academic life as well as anyone. And I believe that that will be as great an asset for USC Annenberg as it was for us at the Pew Charitable Trust. Now Diane's impressive journalistic background also made it possible for her to execute with great success our religion and media strategy, which aimed to provide journalists with timely educational resources to aid in their coverage of religion and public life stories. We have found that the journalistic Swedes, too, are increasingly interested in getting up to speed on the reemergence of public religions in the modern world, to borrow the title of Jose Casanova's interesting book on the topic. We realized that one of the main challenges we face, actually, was in bridging the world of scholarship and the day of the everyday beat reporter. I mean, these are two very disparate worlds. And Diane was superb at helping us at Pew to bridge those two worlds. And running those two portfolios was an excellent opportunity to build that bridge. I think that will be a great asset here as well as she carries forth the mission of the night chair. Now, we explicitly fashion our media strategy at the Trust to get religion out of the God ghetto, as I called it, if you will pardon the expression. We felt that the growing importance of religion in public life argued for getting it out of the religion pages and onto the front page stories on the whole range of domestic and foreign policy issues. In short, we concluded that religion was too important to be left to religion reporters. Now, that's not a knock, by the way, on the many fine religion reporters we have in this country. Some of my best friends are religion reporters, actually. <laughs> now, for better or for worse, as I said, in the forum, we don't take positions on issues. Um, but um, in this instance, I will put the forum hat back on. Okay? For better or for worse, religion is becoming a principal source of people's identity across faith traditions and across religious and uh, geographical boundaries. And this has profound political consequences at home and abroad. So we took as our mantra Peter Jennings' observation, and I'm quoting, that you can find a religious angle on every beat. In politics, it goes without saying, he says. Now Jennings, as many of you know, was quite instrumental in bringing on a full-time religion reporter uh, at ABC News. But he understood that to cover religion well, you also had to pay attention to it as you were covering politics and other important issues. Now, the growing connection 
between religion and public life is much in evidence everywhere we turn. And I hope Diane this gets into more of the substantive kind of talk you said you wanted me to give. But I will make it short. Even in highly secular Europe, this is becoming an issue, much to the chagrin of most Europeans, actually. It seems like only yesterday that the main cultural challenge facing Europeans was how to integrate the various national identities into the European Union. Wasn't that all the talk? It seems like yesterday. Today, all the talk is about how secular Europe will integrate its increasing Muslim population. If you follow the European press, that is the key cultural issue. Closer at home, take our last presidential election, where our analysis at the Pew Forum showed that religious engagement, as measured by church attendance, was the single most important demographic characteristic in predicting how people voted much more important than education, gender, or income level. Or take the emergence of what Philip Jenkins calls the next Christianity in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Unquestionably, there is a major shift in the center of gravity taking place in global Christianity. It is shrinking in the West, just as it is exploding in rapid fashion, and in much more traditional forms in the Global South. Now, the implications, I think, of this trend are very far-reaching. Not least, of course, for this nation of immigrants, these United States. We have, of course, increasing religious diversity in this country, in the post-1965 immigration with the recent influx of Muslims and adherents of, of, of non-Abrahamic faiths joining our ranks. More importantly, perhaps, though, is what this is doing to Christianity in this country. And sometimes we get really caught up uh, on the diversity part in terms of non-Christian religions, and we fail to notice this. But I'm very persuaded here by a comment by sociologist Stephen Warner quote, that what we are witnessing is not the de-Christianization of American society, but the de-Europeanization of American Christianity. Now, this is impacting the Roman Catholic Church, of course, with particular force, but not just the Roman Catholic Church. Every communion is being impacted in a profound way. Speaking of which, next year, will mark the 100th anniversary of what major political movement? Don Miller cannot answer this one. Anybody know? 100th anniversary. Pentecostal, the mod modern Pentecostal movement. So LA will be much on people's minds as you go, I guess, a few blocks north and east to Azusa Street, and that was the epicenter. That's where it started. Over 400 million Pentecostals, booming in places like Africa and Latin America and in parts of Asia, enjoying the fastest growth rate of any Christian group. Huge implications. And of course, with the burial of John Paul II earlier today, how can we not recall the major role he played in this worldwide reemergence of public religion? From his pivotal role in the demise of communism in Eastern Europe and in Poland in particular, to his advocacy of human rights around the world, to his attempts to build bridges with Judaism and Islam. I commented in Jeff's class yesterday uh, the interesting press coverage uh, in the Muslim world that the, uh, the Pope's death has, has received. It's really quite, uh, quite instructive. Speaking of Islam, according to demographers, the center of gravity for Christianity that I alluded to earlier now rests precisely over Timbuktu. Okay? If you go to Timbuktu and put a pin on it and divide the world into quadrants, it will be equally divided in terms of the Christian community. And it is moving south. What's ironic, of course, is that Timbuktu is in the mostly Muslim country of Mali. It is safe to predict that the interface of these two dynamic global forces Christianity and Islam 
will be one of the defining features of the 21st century, and no more so than in Africa. So it's not theological conviction, but this empirical reality that has led journalists such as David Brooks in his memorable phrase to kick the secularist habit and to seek to understand what's going on with public religions in the modern world. Now let me conclude with an interesting little tidbit of Pew history here to wrap this and come back to where we started. Unbeknownst to me, when I arrived at the Pew Charitable Trust from the academy, I'm a recovering academic, I often say, in 1997, in January to be exact, the groundwork for our program in religion and public life, and specifically in the major initiative we would launch in religion and media, had been laid uh, over a year prior to my coming. At that time, I subsequently found out the trust had actually convened a high-level discussion with select media and religion experts on the topic, and this was its actual title, Religion and the Media, What Next? That meeting was convened for the Pew Charitable Trust by none other than Harding Carter, who wrote in the final report he submitted to my future boss and trust president, Rebecca Rimel, that there was a new found readiness by the media to do a better job of covering religion and that the trust should capitalize on that opportunity and quote, institutionalize the moment. And institutionalize it we did, Hari. <laughs> so Diane, I don't know if you knew all of that history, but you owe Hardy not only your current job here at USC, <laughs> You even owed him your job back at the Pew Charitable Trust in Philadelphia. So you owe that man. Harding, I am confident uh, she will do as fine a job for you here uh, at Annenberg as she did for us at the Pew Charitable Trust. The task, I assure you, could not be more timely and more important for our country and for the world. So I wish Diane and the university my very best as you seek to fulfill the worthy mission uh, of the night chair in media and religion. Thank you very much. First of all, I hope everybody feels that they've been at a seminar <laughs> and that it's one that we want to continue to be at together and how spectacular it's going to be, Diane, having you in this role. Uh, and so it's my particular privilege to ask Hotting to join me on the stage and to give you, in fact, a physical demonstration of a spiritual idea. <laughs> I'm too old to be baptized again. <laughs> please, please join us up here. We can formally give you the night chair. because I'd also like to ask Lloyd Armstrong to come join me on the uh, dais here for a special Annenberg treat, which we hope we will be able to, uh, to do more often, which is that when we give a chair to a wonderful chair holder, we also love to give another chair, and that is a chair to the chair giver. And so, Hotting, <laughs> if you'd come back up here. <laughs> This is a chair to the Knight Foundation, and it's your own chair in meeting religion. Uh, let me just say very quickly, 
because I am leaving my post, I can actually accept this and any other goodies you want to give me. <laughs> I know you'll all want to stay for a special reception now and a chance to congratulate Diane and her family, which we should recognize. Isabella, you've been wonderful. Chris, we feel privileged that you two have moved across the country, and it's so wonderful to have your family with us here too, Diane. Please join us for the special reception. Thank you all so much for being here.